The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. I call this meeting to order with great delight. I'm very pleased to be here with everybody again. Uh, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all our lives. We have some written public participation that I trust everybody has received and seen. And we have the end of the year presentation by the State Student Advisory Council. Cherise, are you here somewhere? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to see everyone um, together in a room this year. So um, yes. thank you for that. But hello, everyone. My name is Sharice Miller Odukwe. I'm the Director of Student Activities at the Connecticut Association of Schools. And just like every other year, I'm truly honored to be here with an amazing group of students during this challenging year that looks very different for many of our students. The Council of Leaders came together every month and on their own personal time on a mission to continue to improve Connecticut schools. I would like to thank the administrators, teachers, and um, CAS CIAC staff who came to our meetings every month to help support the council. I'd also like to give a very special thank you to Amanda Pickett from the State Board of Education for all of the work that she has done with the council to support the council. So today, the council will present their findings on the following two topics, best practices around <coughs> remote learning and rebuilding school community after a pandemic. So I'm extremely proud and honored to present the State Student Advisory Council on Education. Hello everyone, good morning and thank you so much for coming today. My name is Madison Lee and I'm a senior at Sport and Medical Sciences Academy in Hartford. So this year as group one, we took on the topic of challenges and solutions to remote learning. Next slide, please. So uh, here are just some other group numbers. Next slide, please. And in this presentation, we split it up into four different parts. First, we have the qualitative research we conducted throughout the year. Then we have identified concerns, solutions, and finally, takeaways for the future. So, uh, next slide, please. For addressing the qualitative research, I'm going to pass it off to Rehan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rehan. Uh, I am from Stratford, Connecticut. So, when we were given this topic this year, we felt it was very important for us to talk to our principals, teachers, and other administrators to kind of see their input, get their perspectives on how remote learning has been. And here are just some things that we received and things that stood out to us. So, first, we see two to three more um, failing classes versus previous semesters during online learning, um, that there is a need to deliver instruction uh, in a new way to help students with consistency, um, chronic absenteeism and as well as a need of empathy. And this is a quote from one of our principals. Next slide, please. So from this research and from our conversations with our principals and other administrators, um, we established some identified concerns. So these are uh, the concerns that we had. First one being rise in chronic absences. Um, second being disengagement in classrooms. Uh, third being the decline in mental health. Fourth, uh, lack of student-teacher interaction, and fifth being Zoom fatigue. So first, we looked at some statistics re related to chronic absenteeism uh, in our state. So as you know, um, chronic absenteeism is defined as an attendance rate that is less than 90%. So the orange lines are um, the attendance rates for the 2019-2020 school year, and the blue lines are from September of this school year. So the general trend in these lines show that ad, uh, attendance in classrooms has actually decreased 
um, with groups such as minorities, students with high needs, students who have free and reduced lunch, English learners, um, students with disabilities, and students who are experiencing homelessness, all on average um, were chronically absent in the beginning of this school year. Uh, next is this engagement in classrooms. Um, in our group conversations, these were just some of the things that we noted that we saw in our classes. Uh, so first being uh, more camera and microphones muted. So people weren't showing themselves. Um, they just, again, were black screens with just the name on it. Um, next being a lack of responses from teacher questions or comments. So again, if a teacher said something, um, there would just be silence in the Zoom, in the Google Meet, whatever it was. And then finally, uh, there would be more distractions at home. So there would be a less of a focus on schoolwork and classwork. And for me personally, um, during remote learning, I took care of both my brother and sister. So that is an example of a distraction that I may have had because then I would be more focused on, you know, caring for them rather than I may be looking at my schoolwork in that moment. And this is just uh, another thing that one of our principals noted. As we mentioned earlier, there were three times as many failing classes this year with 286 and 11% of fully remote students had at least two failing classes. And then next, uh, mental health. Uh, again, many of us can discuss our experiences with mental health related to COVID, you know, not being able to go to places that we'd love to, um, you know, not being able to see family as well. So these are just some statistics that we found that related to these trends that we were all exper experiencing and feeling. So from a poll from Sacred Heart, we see that 31% of respondents indicated a decrease in mental health uh, due to COVID. And then also from the US Census Bureau, from a poll that they did in mid April of this year, 31.5% uh, of adults in Connecticut said that they had symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive or disorder. And in relation to approximately this time last year during 2020, this number was 40.2%. So in 2020, you know, this was during the, I guess, the heights of remote learning and seeing the, I guess, the difference in percentage of anxiety disorder also can kind of be related to the mental health of students um, during remote learning. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then going back to our conversations with our principals and administrators, uh, one of the questions that we asked them were, what are, what are the issues do you think that are most prominent for learning this year? And across the board, these were the two biggest things that they noted, which were connectivity and engagement. So this is a quote, from, again, from one of our principals stating that engagement with students is very difficult this year. In some cases, the technology is the block between the teacher and the student, and sometimes student and education. So again, Connection and engagement, uh, I believe, are very important parts of a student's education. You know, if they're not engaged in the class, if they're not even trying to make an attempt to try and learn, it's hard for them to learn. So just as the principal noted, um, the blockage between the student and the teacher, if they're not engaged or connected, um, can also lead to a blockage in the classroom and the education. And finally, our last identified concern would be Zoom fatigue slash burnout. Again, so many of us could also talk about our experiences with Zoom fatigue. You know, we're on calls many more times throughout the day um, during uh, remote learning, working from home than we would be if we were in person. So Stanford University did a study on this and here are some of the four points that they made. So the first one being excessive amounts, amounts of close-up eye contact. Um, constantly seeing yourself in video chats in real time. Um, the video chats decrease one's usual mobility. And the cognitive load is higher in video chats because, for example, now we are, I guess, reading more of people's, um, I guess, perspectives or emotions in a sense that would be harder for us to comprehend psych psychologically over a computer, over a Zoom call than it would be in person. So now, as we move into the solutions, I will pass it back to Madison. Okay, thank you so much. So moving on to point three. Now that we've covered the research and the specific concerns, it's time to talk about potential solutions. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so first of all, as a group, we took a step back to brainstorm some overarching solutions that can serve to address many problems holistically. The first one, the first one that we have is more empathy and understanding from teachers and administrators. Um, now, many schools have already implemented this approach in the forms of mental health check-ins on the students, such as wellness surveys and Google Forms. The second overarching solution we came up with is, in general, more flexibility. As, as we mentioned, the roles and conditions of students vary I go to a magnet school in Frankfurt with a very diverse student body, and many of my friends this year really struggled with their class attendance as they had to go to school school with their home life, with people such as their siblings or their grandmother and things like that. So, in general, more flexibility all across the board would be really beneficial. Next slide, please. So moving on to specific solutions that particularly target the issues that we mentioned earlier. Um, to address the first problem of attendance, one idea that we have is asking public libraries to reserve private study rooms for students to provide a more focused learning environment. Um, and this again goes back to many students having other obligations and distractions from learning at home. Another potential solution for the attendance issue is having teachers to begin with widely absent students and providing help if needed. The next issue um, to address the issue of the lack of engagement and connection between students and teachers, we propose the solution of having open Zoom calls running throughout the day. And this comes from the fact that the whole learning dynamic has dramatically changed with online learning. And one thing that's really missing in virtual is actually the passing time between classes. Oftentimes, in a normal school day, students would use that time to talk to each other or to interact with teachers and to ask for questions. So by having a Zoom coach or a Zoom channel running throughout the day would really kind of help break that barrier for student-teacher interaction and instill a little bit of normal feedback in the school. Another solution that targets the engagement issue would also be for teachers to brainstorm and to just start classes and more engagement meetings, such as icebreakers or games. And finally, to address the problem of um, emotional well-being, this can be done by student check-ins and the use of social media. We did speak with some educators who mentioned employing the sticky note method, which is when teachers have their students write down what their day looked like yesterday, homework, um, and things like that, as kind of a way to empathize with the student and their vigorous and demanding schedule. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we also have compiled a list of technology that has been popularly used by many school systems and seem to yield success. For example, we have Promethean panels, web camera, microphone setups. Um, we have the whole Google Suite system, which is very popular among many schools. So this includes Classroom, Google Meet, and Google Form. Then we have Jamboard, which is a collaborative um, collage board. Kami, an online PDF editor. And then finally, Pear Deck, which is a live presentation app. Next slide, please. And so finally, moving on to part four, we have takeaways for the future. Next slide, please. thank you. Although there's been a lot of challenges with online learning, there's also a lot of things to learn from this and to really adopt into the years to come. For example, many teachers actually express support for continuing to offer online learning in some capacity in the future, as they cited that it gives a different way for them to connect with students. The second one is this year, many schools have prioritized the mental well-being of students, as we mentioned earlier, through the check-ins and the forms and things like that, which is definitely something that we can carry on into the future. An additional takeaway is taking into account how social or societal issues affect students. And then the next one that we have is altering the curriculum to offer the most important concise lessons, as this year, many teachers have had to adjust their lessons plans to accommodate shorter and more concise classes. And finally, the last ones that we have are teachers and students being able to adapt easier to change from this year, as well as everyone having better access to technology in general. Thank you so much for listening. Open. Are you open for questions at this point? If there are any? any I, I have. Estella. I just want to say how impressed I am with your um, presentation and not only with your understanding of what happened but also your ability to offer suggestions and take away for the future. I think one of the things that is obvious to me, you know, I don't take classes but I do meetings, 
is that using technology, you cannot replicate what happens face to face to face. That's the first mistake. Trying to do online what you do face to face. You have to adapt and you have to sort of um, uh, refrain the way you do the learning piece and teaching piece and engagement. And I think you've captured that very well. I think it does take training, uh, training and that in moving so fast into technology, there wasn't um, enough time to do the training requirements. But you have obviously uh, uh, analyzed and, um, and uh, thought about the process and come up with very good suggestions. Um, I don't know the apps you are recommending because I'm old and I <laughs> but I'm going to um, try to keep abreast and, and learn about those apps and ask my grandchild to who probably can teach me uh, better. Uh, I, so I, you know, I, I truly appreciate. I think also the um, the challenge of engagement and um, you know how do we do that? Because you know, it, it, as, as you said, we see each other, but seeing each other constantly. You know, I know when I'm looking at the computer in my Zoom meetings, and I have very long Zoom meetings. I try to fix my hair, and I could stop. Which hand do I have to use? Because the image is the opposite. So I'm using this hand, and it's supposed to be this hand. And it drives me crazy. And then why should I need to look at myself when I don't do that in a meeting? So I, I can understand, for especially for people who are conscious about their body and they look, how intrusive that is, and how uncomfortable that is to be doing that you know, for a long time. So again, uh, thank you so much. I do hope. You know, we always ask this question is what happens next because these are very thoughtful uh, recommendations. So I hope uh, they are um, collected and um, used to inform and to improve things. Uh, and I do agree with you that continuing to more learning is, is, um, should be one of the things that happen. So thank you so much for your thoughtful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I just, wanted, I just wanted to build on um, what you were saying, so in terms of the what next piece, and, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that not just the collection or, or sharing of this particular information, but that, that schools going forward, and I'm the parent of two high schoolers, um, so my brain is in, in sort of high school mode, that, um, that schools themselves, uh, in particular high schools, will engage students as they're thinking about what do they not throw out and what do they continue to learn from so that um, I don't think we're going to be, go back to completely normal, right, of how things were before. And there were some positive lessons that you have elevated through your research, right? How can we make the school um, experience even more positive by including students in the, the planning and the, the thinking of, what, of how things function going forward? Yeah, I, I just want to echo what everybody else has said, and I would tell you, you know, what are the next steps of stuff? I went to Stanford, I pulled up the research uh, a report that you identified from Stanford, and I've already sent it to some co-workers on a cognitive load. So thank you very much. It's already it's already leaving the leaving the building. So uh, <laughs> great, great job. thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> So uh, I just wanted to thank uh, both of you for the presentation and understanding that we're really in the throes of addressing the issue of what the next school year looks like. Uh, and so your issues that you've identified around chronic access, uh, one that we're looking at very closely, uh, looking at uh, interventions and how to support our districts and using the real-time data that we have to help inform uh, our efforts, the issue of mental health, one, one we're also paying very close attention to. So this is very helpful report uh, that we can add to say this is student voice uh, in the midst of everything else that we're doing. So I just really want to thank you very much and we'll be sharing that internally and maybe adding that to uh, reports that we may be doing that we've gotten student input uh, to inform our decisions. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Chair? Thank you. Yeah. I do want to uh, my name is a Will Dariasco. I do want to elaborate as to what our commissioner mentioned is that um, it would be good to look at pockets of patterns of who those absentees 
and those uh, students that were uh, that were not on camera, because you mentioned that you know distraction at home, there, there, you know, uh, and and, th and that that's very common uh, because a lot of students are, are are sharing you know room space right with their siblings or family members, not just a single mom or mom and dad, but also extended family. So I would be curious to to, to see what are those practices of studies of who who these students are. And uh, so that we can uh, be prepared in the future to uh, meet their needs so that they can academically, uh, uh, we can provide access to them. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you want to comment on that or? As a student, I just wanted to see if you had input on that. that, that if you don't, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting thing because again, like, like we said the situations of students like it's even for me changed a ton over the last year and it's something that i would say many of my friends many of people that i knew in school it changed for them as well so i think finding those things and finding ways to support people whose situations probably changed a ton i think would be very beneficial because again so many things changed in the last year so i think finding ways to support um, again, if someone needs to stay home for a week, for example, if they need to take care of their grandmother or something like that, I think that would uh -huh. be very helpful going into the future. So thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Nice report, by the way. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the mental health issues. Uh, do you feel that the students are getting the help that they need? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think this year, um, like I mentioned earlier, there's definitely been a lot a much greater focus on mental health, which has definitely benefited a lot. I know that personally in my classes, my teachers have been doing a lot of things such as gratitude forms where we, before like as an attendance kind of, for like that, we um, we write what we're grateful for, or how we're feeling. And I definitely think that it's um, been pretty beneficial across the board. Hey, uh, yeah, just, you know, thank you for the report. You guys did a great job of putting all this together. Uh, it, there was you mentioned a number of different technologies that are available. Can you just touch on a couple of them? There, the names are familiar to you. Not to me, so. <laughs> like yeah, the so you're, uh, you're mentioning the technologies, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we um, we mentioned. Um, a lot of people or a lot of schools have been using just the Google Suites, which include Google Forms, Google Classroom, Google Meets, and those seem to be very successful. Um, there's also Jamboard, um, which is very popular as a lot of students can collaborate on one document at a time. It's like kind of a collage board where you can have images and text and things like that. And then I think the next one we mentioned was Pear Deck, which is a live presentation app where teachers can pretty much just broadcast their slideshows for class lessons and things like that. We have this Promethean panel. What is that? Promethean panels is it's kind of similar to um, Pear Deck, where teachers can broadcast their slideshow. Okay. Wow. Thank you very much. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I've got a question. Let's assume that as of September, schools are going to be able to open again and everybody will be back in school, I think, in Connecticut as highway wide coin. How much home computer to teacher activity would you expect? How much would be desirable and on top of the normal school day? Um, so the question referring to like how much of remote learning would we like in the next year, for example? Yeah, assuming you've got a full school day too. Okay, um, so this was something even we discussed as a group, um, just some like ideas that we thought would be beneficial for next year. Um, some examples would be like the idea of like snow days um, so we could have like a couple of days reserved for, I guess, closure of school. Um, like, let's say maybe three to five days, something like that, that would be um, reserved as like a day off of school. So students, you know, can help shoveling or help with their family, things like that. 
But for example, if there was a period of like a blizzard or something, now we have that option of remote learning. So students aren't missing like, for example, two weeks of school. And another thing that we talked about were the idea of maybe having um, remote days a couple of days before and maybe even after like breaks. So for example, like the winter break, um, you know, several students may be traveling to different states or a different country, for example. So having those days, excuse me, being remote um, before then still allows those students to have the option to join into their class and they're not losing, um, you know, any extra absences for the school year. So, so you do see an important continuing role for both students and teachers through the screen. Yeah, I, because again, like we said uh, earlier that the, this year kind of changed so many things and it opened up so many things as well. So now that we've, I guess, been through a year and a half of being on the computer, it kind of allows us to look at some areas of like a normal school year where we could sort of implement it or where there may be like deficiencies from years before where we could use it and, you know, so have a, I guess, coercive and good school year. Thank you. Any other questions for this? I take it there's a part two for your presentation? Another group. Oh. I need to applaud them. see me? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, right, so we are the second group of the State Student Advisory Council on Education, and today we are going to be talking to you about rebuilding and maintaining our school communities um, after this year of a pandemic. So just to get to know us, um, we are all sophomores, juniors, and seniors from a variety of schools all around Connecticut. So our plan of action during the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and the transition into online and remote learning, it's become evident that school communities in Connecticut are in need of serious rebuilding in order to improve and increase student interest in our schools and to bring back aspects of school community and spirit. Our team decided that we must first gain a complete understanding of student, teacher and administrative attitudes towards these issues. So after collaborating as a group to decide what the most relevant dilemmas faced by school populations are, we created a survey to send out to schools so that we could analyze and evaluate the data and create a plan of action from there. So just to give you an overview of our survey, uh, we asked questions like, what's your definition of the school community? Uh, how would you rate your relationships with students, teachers, and faculty? And other student organizations and what existing practices go on at your school to maintain that community and have they been effective. Uh, we sent the survey out to a random sample of high school students and teachers from across Connecticut and we were very grateful to have 304 responses from a variety of different schools. So in the next few slides, we'll briefly summarize all of the quantitative and qualitative data that we collected. One of the very first questions that were in our survey asked about how much our surveyees wanted a strong community in their schools. From our data, we can see that 72.7% .7 want a strong community in their schools. This goes to show how necessary it is for there to be some sort of interaction or engagement in the school community and why our objective reaches to do so.
Okay. So our second question that we asked was, how involved were you in your school community last year? And if you actually click on the animation that's present, you will actually notice that involvement in our school communities has declined, uh, which shows that they plan, students plan to be less involved in their school, school community this year during this pandemic compared to last year, given the current pandemic. And for a school to have a successful climate and culture, uh, we recognize that this community has to be present and strong enough during good times and bad. So before COVID and during COVID and after COVID, we recognize this is a real uh, necess necessity for school community. So another facet that we looked at was inclusion in our school communities. This graph shows that out of 303 responses, 170, one of them, which is a majority, don't feel fully included in their school community. And in order to create a positive, good school community, we need to include students better, whether that be remote or in person. Uh, so another thing that we looked at was relationships between students and students, students and teachers, students and other faculty members such as counselors or coaches and students with their relationships with their school organizations such as clubs and unsurprisingly over a hundred students said that they out of a scale from one to five it was a five that they all respect their relationships with other students the most and especially during a time where everything like students couldn't go with students because of like online presence and everything there's some disconnect. So in order to rebuild that, it would be best to have some classroom activities, some passing time, or increasing lunch times to make sure that students are getting the connections that they want. And they also respect their relationships with their teachers, even though it's not as strong. It's a mix between four and five. So they still want some sort of like valuing time between their trusted adults. And obviously clubs wasn't that, oh, sorry. Clubs wasn't that uh, necessary because of COVID and they didn't realize that clubs weren't a thing. So we need to rebuild those as much. So we also looked at what existing practices or activities go on at a person's school and how they help maintain school community. So from the chart, you can see that 61.68.1 of the responses that we collected say that there's already teacher-student interactions at their schools that work to maintain a school community with the runner-up, which is around 62.5% being club activities. So from this data, we concluded that if schools manage to improve communication between um, teachers and students and also work to create more club activities, a school's community will be enhanced through. We also uh, were really lucky to have some good quotes that uh, students submitted along with that survey. Um, we kept them anonymous, but we would like to share a few of them. So this first one on the top left, uh, I feel like I look forward most to my interactions with teachers when I talk to them after class and after school, but this year that isn't an option. So it really feels like I'm not building a relationship with any of my teachers. Um, and as for club activities, while our clubs do meet sometimes, it really doesn't feel like it did last year, which makes me sad, especially when I think about all the out-of-school activities we did as clubs last year. So what we took out of that, uh, that quote from that student is all those little in-between spaces for interaction between um, the structured classroom time, all those little organic conversations that happen that really form that community. We miss those uh, over the last year. So the quote on the top right says that, I feel like I'm losing my bond to my school because more and more of my school experience is centered around my desk in my room. I know that's just the situation we are in, but it just makes me look forward to when hopefully next school year, we can return to some type of normal in school. So while a lot of schools such as mine have reopened fully, there's a lot of schools throughout the state that are still virtual and there are students who choose to stay at home. So it's important that we take into consideration um, those students, the remote ones, as well as the ones that are returning back to school or have returned back to person already. 
And the last quote there, uh, they do club activities on Zoom, but that's about it. So after spending hours on Zoom all day, we have to go on another Zoom for a club. And that, that connects to the, what the first group was talking about with Zoom fatigue and um, that's essentially how, that's essentially it, that um, the, um, if there's too many of those virtual meetings and Zooms, then we, it starts to get to be a little bit too much. Next slide, please. So now we have uh, a series of recommendations that uh, we were able to create based on that survey and our own thoughts. Our number one recommendation would be to improve and increase student input in our school communities. We found that students are often faced with obstacles regarding matters such as schedule changes, advisory lessons, and school activities in which they have limited to no input. In order to gain an effective understanding of the real issues students face in today's schools, we advise educators to frequently inquire about and obtain student attitudes through the use of surveys. This data and research should be collected through direct contact with students, not from other sources like their parents. The major impact of this is that educators will gain a deeper understanding of what students are experiencing instead of deciding for themselves what the issues regarding youth are today. In order to know how to affect change in our schools, the point of view of students are both necessary and beneficial in creating a stronger school community where all parts of the student body are comfortable and able to share their thoughts and experiences. So some of the short-term effects of this implementation include productive changes to the school system. Um, student input in decision-making also ensures that students are happy with the changes that a district or a school makes. For example, my high school, Pomparog High School, went through around three to five schedule changes this entire year. And every time my peers and I were surprised at the change, we didn't know sometimes until like a day or two beforehand. And we weren't necessarily uh, excited about some of these schedule changes, but so, but I think some of the bigger problems were the fact that we didn't even know the schedule was going to change until a few days in advance. Um, districts should take the initiative not only to ask parents and a select few students um, their opinions, but most, if not all students, about their opinions on large schedule changes or any other changes across the school so students can know what may, may be happening and have some input on what that change is. Some of the longer term effects of this recommendation is that students feel like their voices are actually being heard and they feel more comfortable in their environment and engaged in their school community. By being a part of the active decision making process at the school level, students can feel more connected to their schools as, as a whole. Then this is the second recommendation, which is wellness sections. So usually school days are often long and mundane. They have the same schedules throughout the whole day. So while they're majorly effective, having some sort of like time period within the day or within the week for students to focus on themselves and building those relationships with other students and the teachers may benefit them more mentally and physically. So maybe having something where school starts most schools start like one hour later, one day per week, or having like one hour in their school day, like my school does. Like every Wednesday, we all have online school because that's the day where you get to focus on yourself and focus on what you have to catch up on. So stuff like that just makes going to school much more enjoyable and having those relationships better. So the immediate impacts of that are, of course, that students will look forward to their day more and that obviously increases student motivation and that strengthens all those student communities. Um, and in the long term, connecting with some of those earlier statistics, um, students really value their relationships with other students. So having a good mentality coming into the school with those relationships creates more opportunities for conversations between them and their peers even between students and teachers and all of those different relationships that help build that community. Okay, so our third recommendation that we made is general communication. Uh, unsurprisingly, as we've established earlier, uh, students value relationships with their teachers, as well as their time with uh, tr other trusted adults and administrators and faculty, and um, schools thrive on this. So communication is incredibly important in this case. 
Uh, my school, like many others, has had to step up its communication game since the pandemic first began. And because of this, parents and to a large extent students uh, have been able to get information as soon as possible through some direct lines of communication to make action plans in terms of how the school is reacting to an outbreak or any social emotional well-being that exists in the school. So the following recommendations that you see on the slide have been made effective in solving this issue. Uh, so at the district level, what we see is um, different website strategies, which are gonna be discussed a little bit later, uh, text messaging, translations, and uh, other direct communication through staff and families. Uh, one clear example uh, that has been used frequently in many schools is School Messenger, which is found to be very effective. And again, this is supposed to help make the district communication more effective and more organized. At the school level, we talk about um, school leaders uh, scheduling regular home visits uh, with other students and families. Earlier in the pandemic, this might not have been as feasible, but as we notice that things are starting to open up, open up again, uh, this rec recommendation is actually more feasible. And at the classroom level, we talk about uh, maintaining some virtual office hours to meet with students so that teachers are readily available as soon as the student has any issue, uh, social, emotional, or academic. And we also talk about uh, effective communication strategies like emails and text messages, of which the primary focus is either academic or social emotional. So the immediate impacts would be students, instructors, and parents will all be on the same page, preventing any additional misunderstanding. The long-term impacts will be by adhering to the suggestions, district and school leaders will be able to maintain effective communication in a positive school atmosphere regardless of whether the building is open or closed. As seen by the statistics in slide nine, this will increase the ties to students' value of adults. Our fourth recommendation is to utilize school websites. So the challenges is um, that school websites are often either lacking updated information, difficult to navigate, or are so underutilized that they serve no purpose to the students. So personally, my school website is very outdated and difficult to navigate. And when I first started my freshman year, I had many questions about clubs, activities, and AP classes that were offered. But the confusing layout made it hard to find any of these pages, and that made me doubt if the website even had what I was looking for. And furthermore, many of the clubs and extracurriculars listed were outdated and no longer existed because the website hadn't been updated in years. So the solution to this is to make sure that school websites or accessible alternatives are, are utilized well um, and are updated regularly. Having pages with organized lists of clubs, sports teams, and um, extracurriculars can also heighten participation uh, in these activities. And it is also important to make sure that the website is easy to navigate since confusing layouts often discourage students. So, with only 62% of students believing that club activities are contributing towards uh, their sports and 60% are contributing towards the student body, it is fairly apparent that there is some disconnect between students and their involvement. The question often being asked is, how can we get students more involved? What many aren't considering though, is that these students want to be more involved, but are missing the bridge, uh, something like a school website should provide. Immediately, these percentages should increase in the following year. And after two to four years, these statistics should ultimately plateau with a very gradual rise in involvement as the changes are fully implemented statewide. With this immediate increase in activity, schools will see an overall boost in student involvement, improved relationships between students and staff, and a higher level of success within the programs listed on these respective websites. Right, and to conclude our presentation, um, next slide, please. Looks like we skipped one. If we can go backwards one slide. Okay, maybe that didn't make it into the presentation. So um, our survey results showed that the majority of students want a strong school community. Um, as you saw from the grants, but involvement and inclusion in those communities has declined this year due to the COVID pandemic. 
um, and the relationships of all types, whether those were student student, student to teacher, student with school clubs and sports, and all of those are vital to a strong school community. And those are valued by students. So our four recommendations are to collect and utilize student input when making decisions, include wellness time in the school schedule, streamline communication to improve those student to school relationships, and update and encourage the use of school websites and digital resources. And we'll we'd be happy to take any of your questions. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question here. Go ahead. Um, on, this, on, on this report, um, you mentioned a little bit about parents. Okay, parents. You said in one section, you know, we want the engagement with the teachers and the students and then getting their opinion without getting parents. And then there's another section that you said involves parents. So um, I, I just wanted, I, I just need some clarity as to if you're rebuilding and maintaining a school community, where does the what where do you see the parents taking part of this whole remote learning? If, if you had a chance to look at this, because you you all know it as, as a parent, um, and I and I, if I'm not familiar with how Zoom works or remote learning, that's gonna keep me disengaged from this from the community of where my child is assisted. So was that looked at, was that a conversation that you had? Um, in, in building this, this uh, project? Um, could you just to clarify your questions about the role of parents in that school community? Right. Um, another Patrick, would you like to take that? Yeah, so. Uh, um, so I think that we've come to the consensus that um, during the pandemic, the communication definitely has lacked a bit and um, it's really, really important for the students to have the most input and for parents to just be a resource to aid in the remote learning process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, the majority of that feedback, um, of course, we value parent impact as well, the parent feedback, because parent, parents know their, their children the best, obviously, but we recognize that students can also provide valuable feedback in and of themselves. Thank you. you guys did a great job on this, um, this report and the survey. Very, it's extremely well done. I, I gotta tell you, you are not alone in terms of Zoom fatigue. Either for your parents, and a lot of other people are experiencing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, was there anything that in the data that surprised you? The one thing that surprised me personally was. Um, the um, the different types of relationships. Um, I was personally a little surprised to see that student relationships with school organizations weren't valued as much as say student to student relationships or student to teacher relationships. Um, initially, I was surprised about that, but then when I did some thinking, I realized well that's probably because this year was a weird year with COVID and a lot of those school organizations didn't really function at the same level as they would have say in my earlier years because i'm a senior right now so i still remember how they operated freshman and sophomore and junior years um, students who might be new to high school maybe don't have those same memories that i have so that could have impacted how students see school organizations this year thank you Something that yeah. um, surprised me personally is that um, at my school, I'm very lucky to have been in person all year long and to have my clubs up and running. And I don't think I really actually realized the actual situation that many schools in Connecticut have to deal with. And um, I didn't realize that the extent to which those activities really weren't functioning. So that definitely surprised me. 
Wait a minute. Thank you. She got cut off like that. Can I hear um, Again, thank you so much for such a well done presentation. I'm impressed. I've been a member of the board for a number of years. Each year, the presentations are more solid in terms of the research, the preparation, and not only that, but uh, the recommendations. You, know, you identify the issues and you take us to, to the action. And one of the things that I value for your presentation is you see and you remind us that students are really at the asset of the school. Mm -hmm. They are not just there to receive, they're part of you know, what makes the school great and part of the uh, essence of how uh, to, to express the whole thing by counting on students going to the school. But my question is, since each of you are in different schools, were you able to provide this feedback to the school? Was this something you share with them? Was any, any of these recommendations already part of the discussions you had in your own schools? Or is this a secret that we're now hearing for the first time? <laughs> <laughs> I can speak for um, myself at Allison High School. Um, I certainly plan on um, talking with our administrators about some of the some of our findings. Um, I, d I do feel like we do a few of these because this year um, Allison High School added a early release schedule to uh, Wednesday um, every week, which which really helped with that wellness time. And we also have advisory blocks, which a lot of the students on the um, on the council said that they have at their schools. Um, just that time for organic, non-academic conversations. Um, and in terms of collecting and utilizing student input, um, we do some of that at our school, but I can certainly see us um, gathering even more input. Maybe I'll let these players talk about their schools. Uh, so my You're school, did, am I still muted? No. Okay. My school didn't really utilize student input as much as it should have. Like I mentioned in the presentation, like four or five scheduled changes in the span of um, just around like six months. And all, every single time, my friends and I did not know that we were going to have a schedule change. So we were kind of surprised by this fact. And the most recent schedule change was changing all of our days to half days. And they took out advisory, they took out lunch, and they added these after school online academic check-in periods where teachers could request students to come in and get extra help um, when they needed it, but some of the teachers used this academic check-in time to teach additional content. So it felt like you were going to school from seven to 12, coming back home, and from like one to two o'clock, you were doing some more learning. So my school, I think, was kind of the opposite from my Ushman's because they kind of pushed a lot of things onto the students when I think they could have utilized student input more and realized that these after-school check-ins online uh, were actually doing more harm. Some teachers started um, giving tests and exams during that little period, and that just uh, negatively affected a lot of students. Thank you. Here we go. Chair Taylor. Wanted to add, so my thanks to you all for the presentation as well. And I really appreciated the quotes from students, liking student voices. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when I read about, you know, uh, missing out on inter interactions with teachers that you normally would talk after class or after school, and also the quote about my school experiences centered around my desk in my room actually make, a, make me think about and appreciate the hard work that our district did to be able to offer in-person learning so that that level of social, socialization could take place. Uh, so. While both presentations, one in remote learning and this one in good community, I really see them connected, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in many ways, and certainly information that we will be using here and share with others. So if you've not shared it with your school yet, please do, uh, so that they have it uh, available to them. Thank you. 
Any other comments? Just on that point, um, the, I remember in previous years, we've actually ensured that presentations that the department then push out to the district so that they have it. Is it something that we can do this time just yeah. to be proactive in ensuring that? I'm my new. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was thinking, especially when they mentioned um, the website. Um, I think, I too think that is a, that's a big issue. Very often I'm contacted um, by different folks, and I'll try to go on to the website just to get a better idea of what is going on. And it amazes me how so many of them are not updated. And that certainly is a, a, a big problem for parents. I, I only imagine as a parent if I had to go on there to manipulate, to try to maneuver through the website to find out that this schedule was for last year. Um, so it's interesting that the students also picked that up, that they were very hard to maneuver through them. Um, and so many of them are not updated. And that's some, something we need to get out to our districts because I imagine parents and as well as students mm -hmm. wanting to try to figure out what, you know, what day is this? What schedule are we on? You know, what schedule change has been made? And the very place that you should be able to go to is not updated really mm -hmm. should be. So um, I'm glad that this is going to go out asked the districts because I think they really need to look at that because um, I think it is an issue. Uh, Chair, this would be uh, students, this would be a, a good ongoing project to create small groups in the different districts because you have a good body of, of high schools here and your sophomore juniors and seniors and, uh, and this would be a good assignment for your classrooms to continue uh, extending <laughs> the, the work that that you all work on, you're saying recommendations, that would be a recommendation that I would give you all, is to uh, you know, make recommendations for those websites. Talk about how better improvement, talk about all, this, all those different ways of technology that are working. And, 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 we can, and you can bring it back to us and see how that's working, to see the success. Because like somebody said, this is your voice. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have an executive session, do we? No. Okay, no executive session. Have a motion for the minutes of May 5th and May 19th. So moved. And. Any discussion? Can someone second? Second. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to go All right, thank you. Remember? Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Chair Taylor. So in your supplemental packet, you have uh, the commissioner's report. I just really want to highlight a few things that you'll hear more about uh, in our agency update. But uh, as you know, we've been very busy working on our art, uh, art as a state plan in developing that. Uh, you'll get an update of that today. Uh, we had to engage, as we engaged you, engage the public as well. So Kathy will provide some update on that, but we've been busy doing that. Also, our collaboration with ETH certainly continues on the availability of K-12 COVID-19 screening tests. Uh, and Jessica later and John will provide you some information so you know how the districts that are taking advantage of that, even for the summer, uh, going forward uh, and moving forward. And we continue to work with DTH uh, on updating our guidance uh, based on CDC changes and um, districts are certainly waiting, as you can well imagine, to get uh, updated information from us. So we certainly are continuing to do that work as well. On the agency front, uh, some of you may have seen communication from the governor around state agencies and their return to their buildings, back to their offices. For those agencies that are front-facing with customer service June 1 was that uh, deadline. Uh, and for everybody else, we're working on the July uh, deadline to, to be able to bring staff back into the building safely. And so uh, we are in the throes of working on that right now. Certainly with, with input uh, internally, again, to be sure that our staff members are feeling safe 
uh, uh, coming back into our building. And it's not coming back to work because work never stops. Uh, it really is coming back into, into the building. Uh, I think we probably have more people here today because of the board meeting. You don't see them in this room because they're socially distanced. Uh, but they're also the wings uh, paying attention to the meeting here as well. So that will certainly be occurring. Uh, the one other two other items I wanted to share with you was uh, the visit to Bristol um, with our with the governor. And really a uh, great opportunity to visit classrooms and literally and hearing from students who were in the building talking about their experiences and the mind shift that they've had to develop uh, over the years. But also connecting them back to our ESSER funding, it was great to be able to walk from uh, classroom to classroom and the superintendent and others being able to say, and this is what ESSER $1 did for us, and this is what ESSER $2 we're able to leverage to do, and this is what we're planning for. Also on that tour, we had uh, the mayor of town and, and the head of parks and recreation really speaking together about how they're working uh, as a uh, that they're working together to make sure that the needs of students and families are met. And that's really what we're trying to also model um, and, and encourage folks to do, to do this as a holistic process of uh, working together. And so that was really great to see that in action. And, and finally pointing out that our Commissioner's Roundtable for Family and Community Engagement in Education has not stopped. Uh, we had a recent meeting where we're really hearing from members about how best to continue to share information and engage our families uh, and communities around all the good efforts and the work that we're doing together. So you have the full report, but I just really wanted to highlight to share those with you and I'll open for any questions. Uh, are there any of the staff, will, will they be an option for some staff to work remotely or will just everybody be back? So uh, we're certainly looking at that, you know, whether staff may need accommodation. But the plan right now is to be able to get everyone back, not necessarily all together on the same day, of course, we're talking about uh, that kind of a maybe a hybrid approach. But the concept of the governor is saying that, you know, we are in a place that we can be making that return uh, to the office uh, for work. Any other questions? Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Takes us to item 6A. I have the motion. That's the note of the schedule for next year. Second. I, I would like to uh, propose that we move the October meeting from October 5th to October 12th. October 5th next year is uh, Rosh Hashanah. I'm sorry, it's actually Yom Kippur. Um, so. Is there any objection to that? Okay, so we'll take that as having an amendment to the proposed schedule. And all in favor of the schedule as amended? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Chair. Have almost nothing to say. I'm very glad to be back with you all. Uh, I expect I will be missing the September meeting because of a wedding in Seattle that we'll be going out to. But other than that, what am I missing out? Oh, right. A note from Al. We we normally schedule a July meeting, but Rarely have it, but there will be a July meeting this year on July 14th, uh, which I'm probably going to try to attend remotely because I'll be in New Hampshire, I believe. Um, will there be an option to, re to attend remotely? Uh, that's, that's, that's something that we have to work through. It's been complicated, which is to do as you know. Yes. Uh, which is why we've worked to bring, uh, and thank you all uh, for allowing us to be able to plan in person. <clears throat> so that's something I'm looking at Desi, who does a lot of our planning for us. Yeah, so the reason that uh, we are here in person is because of the logistical issues we've run into trying to run a hybrid and after last month's meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Stella, for uh, your notes, but 
we'd like to get back to in-person at this point and um, in-person only option. So if somebody cannot be present, they can call in, but not necessarily Correct. access to the uh, Zoom Correct. or to go to me. So you do it by telephone. Yeah, I mean you could you could um, I believe you could listen to it or you could you could watch it streaming because it's it's streaming live um, as we're in here, so that would be an option. It will but be it wouldn't streaming. be interactive, you wouldn't be able to interact back and forth. But you it will be streaming live so it can be watched and if you're on the phone too, presumably. Yeah, the phone I can confirm for you, but you can definitely watch it online. Okay. So is, is the point of clarity chair going back to the regular meeting date? July sixth tentative or July 13th tentative. What what does that mean? It's May. It's, okay. it's, it's tentative on the schedule because basically because it's July. For instance, I believe for July 6th, that's the week where you actually celebrate July 4th. Right. So in addition to it then being July 4th and it's the summer that might end up being a bad time for the board members. So then we give you the alternative of the, the second July date that might be more accommodating. And we often don't have a July date, yeah. at least in the old days. Right, in the past we have been, but since um, COVID, we started having special meetings and July meetings. And this year, um, we are also going to have a July meeting, but that July is usually um, added to the agenda as tentative because there are war years where we didn't need the July meeting and it was then canceled. That's right. Thank you. And we can all hope that next year will be a normal year. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, so it's the July meeting for this July 14th. Correct. Correct. It was adopted on the schedule for either July 7th or the 14th, and it's been determined now that it will be July 14th. She said, "We'll be because it's about building." <laughs> yes, right, yes. And I will probably be trying to call in for that. We'll see. Okay. Um, I have the chair. Other than the July meeting being held, there is nothing in the report of the chair. Other than being very glad. Be back. I expect that the addition to the July meeting will be um, heading off to Seattle. The time is September meeting with this. Um, chair, the, the August third retreat is that going to be an all day, or what, what is the plan for that? The That's August third retreat. So the retreat, we'll have to actually get back to you on it right now. It's just scheduled. Um, we need to start working on a location. And um, the goal is to have it in person. And um, in the past, the in-person meeting retreats were longer. But I also believe that part of the retreat, um, I don't want to plan anything, but I know that part of it will be for board members to um, get a chance to interact. And then you'll go back to the discussion and planning up your strategic plan. So um, we will get back to you soon on that, um, whether it's the timing and how, what they anticipate will be the length of the meeting. I, I will have, this is for next year. The retreat for this year is August 4th. This oh. is 2022. Estella, thank you for, for I'm sorry, I thought you were referring to this yeah. year. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was referring to this, but, but Estella, thank you, so August 4th. August 4th is the retreat for this year. Which I will be forced to pass. Okay. Um, financial matters. Yes. Nothing on the report. No, Chair Stella, did you have no, no. Okay. Nothing on financial matters. Well, we have money. <laughs> <laughs> May I have? Excuse me. A motion on the consent agenda? I, will, I would like to remove one item from the consent agenda. Which is? The receipt of the report of racial imbalance. Good. Okay. 
that will be separately discussed. Anything else to be removed? I guess uh, I think it'd be you know, on the I take it if the consent agenda passes, that's it. We don't no discussion on this. There's no discussion. Or right. So anything you want to discuss, we just take off. That's easy enough. I guess the only thing I would uh, suggest is that maybe A and B, not for a discussion, but at least a reading of the names. So if, if they are, if someone is tuned in, they get to hear the name, which is you know for the fine work that they've done. Okay. So A and B and the style. Which one were you? I like the people of Yes. Okay. I would I would add C to that. It's all about I have the same mm -hmm. one. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure at least their names showed up in the minutes, which I was assured they would. Yes. Uh, but I think Sue, be, I see it also if we're going to read names because they're all recognized recognition. Yes. Um, okay. Anything else to take out the consent? To have a, a motion on the consent agenda without A, B, C, or I? Well, um, Burr moved it, but we need a second. Okay. 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 <laughs> You're trying. Second, second. I think, since this is the consent agenda, that there is no discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. So I think that takes us to 9A. Um, we have a motion. Okay. Second. Okay, thank you. This was to recognize our various adult education award offers. Um, all very impressive people. I don't know what what there is to say beyond that. I think we wanted to name this great. Yeah, read the names. So if somebody watches the video, okay. so this resolution recognizes the following people for their accomplishments in adult education. Um, I'll read the name down. I used to read. It's going to be a challenge, no, 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 especially no, for the math. I, I used to be named as commencement and the name started. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, we are recognizing the uh, individuals for their accomplishment in adult education. Fatima and Margotata Agustoska, Carol Bennett, Angel Freeman, Maria Maria Lazaro, Jemaine Mandu, Noah Kudia, and Anthony Rongeta. We will take that a pause. This fire vote unanimously in support of this resolution. Thank you. Um, career and technical, the GED Scholar Award. This resolution recognizes Matthew Piazza of Litchfield for demonstrating exceptional skill and proficiency in the four subject areas of the high school equivalency exam by attaining a total score of 763 on the GED, GED test that honors him for his accomplishments directs the commissioner to take appropriate action. Yes. I'll ask for motion on that, please. Ask for motion on that, please. Uh, yes, we do. So moved. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I say, may I have a motion? I move. Second. Al, why don't you now visit the. Yeah. Resolution 9C recognizes the career and technical student organizations of various places for their uh, 
accomplishments and assistance in providing the vital important uh, leadership skills to our students. And the clubs recognized as the Distributive Education Clubs of America, New Fairfield High School, and New Fairfield Future Business Leaders of America, Humboldt High School, Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, South Windsor High School. The FFA, which those of us who are old enough would know as the Future Farmers of America, at Lyman Hall High School, Future Health Professionals at Stratford High School, Skills USA, and we met Oliver Walter at Technical High School, and the Technology Student Association at Killingly High, High School in Asia. I think what this shows is the wide range of important extracurricular activities the importance of policy as activities, especially now, uh, in enriching the education of our students get. Any further discussion? Do we have a motion, Mark? All in favor? Aye. 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 Establishing a wider acknowledgement of 
the impact of institutional racism and perhaps the interplay of that impact on things like education. And so I'm hopeful that as we move forward, we may also be able to engage a more cross-sectional um, and cross-agency effort to address the types of things that are reflected in these statistics, but aren't always you know, easily um, fixed in one lane. Perhaps we need to instead expand our, our um, conversations with these schools as to who else um, they need to have at the table to make the actual improvements to support it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do believe that bringing um, board chairs and uh, superintendents to our meetings is important because they do hear us and they do understand our expectations. Um, that it helps them to um, ignite their moving ahead with concrete action plans. Again, I'm sort of um, Losing patience because maybe of my age I want to be alive and they finally come out of racial imbalance. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, um, you know, I want to see concrete steps, not you know, hiring a consultant. They hire I don't know how many consultants to, to, to do this. And, uh, and again, you know, I, I, do, I do understand that you're being watchful and uh, thoughtful. Uh, it's not a question of. Of the work that you are doing, uh, really making sure that the, uh, these places are accountable and uh, more accountable in addressing the issues. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I, I was struck by the fact that some of these schools have been on this list for yeah. oh, well over 20 years. Yeah, now. yeah. And it just. Yeah. Absolutely. Either it, it seems to be that almost inexplicable. Uh, and here, since that was frustration, I don't understand why that should be. Either the statute doesn't make any sense, and we should try to get it amended uh, in a way that makes it more workable. Well, certainly we will recommit and refresh. Um, I, I know that. Uh, whatever has been perhaps stalled over time, either uh, historically or certainly with COVID. And so I, I do appreciate the uh, public reminder as to the importance, and, and we'll certainly communicate that both to my team and to the boards that we're discussing so that we can get them here to, to provide some, uh, as you put, Vice Chair, some not, not plans, but up to date progress reports. Yeah. It's, it's really such a long period, especially the two schools in Greenwich, I think. Yeah. So either the statute should be changed or we have to get more attention to it. Understood. Thank you. The other discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Turns it over to you, Charlie. Thank you. So we are at the point of the meeting to provide you with a critical agency updates uh, as we've been doing each month just to make sure we continue in form uh, of where we are and the staff are in the wings so we they can do trip updates. Uh, the things uh, we will cover are uh, the summer enrichment updates so you know where we landed on summer uh, summer uh, enrichment program. Certainly, they are a sub plan update so you know where we are. Uh, on that, we also want to make sure we're publicly updating you on the five year plan uh, that you, the board is working on. A uh, quick legislative update that Laura will tell us where we are, which probably won't be a lot because we're almost done with session. The health and safety update that I mentioned earlier, and then just uh, upcoming up opportunities and shout outs as we've been doing as well. So, Chris uh, is here. Thank you, being in person. As well to give us the update on summer which Great. Well, good morning or well, afternoon. I'm not sure what time it is, but good morning. Good um, morning. So there's a good slide that you have in front. I'll kind of go through it um, as you read it. But if you remember, to the uh, American Rescue Plan set aside, there was 11 million dollars specifically for uh, summer enrichment. And so what we did is we set out to create a grant program to deploy those funds, and we created two. Grants 
Uh, one was expansion grants for smaller community-based organizations that were going to expand slots where they were going to offer scholarships or reduce rates for families. And then we also had an innovation grant, which was for uh, larger programs that were looking to scale innovative, bold ideas regionally or statewide. So, you know, it's better ever been in a meeting where we said, what could we do if we had more money? This was kind of the, the attempt to get to those kinds of programs. So we received on the expansion grant side, again, the, the smaller grants, those were up to 25,000. We received over 269 applications. Uh, 230 of them were eligible, and we awarded about 210 grants. So we awarded 210 grants. So that was, we had a high yield rate, about 80%. So there weren't many programs that weren't awarded. If they weren't awarded, it was because they were ineligible in most cases. And for those that were awarded below the cut score, it was because it just wasn't a, a solid application. And we wanted to make sure that we were providing high quality summer enrichment opportunities as provided by the federal guidelines. So that pocket of money was, is gonna deploy about $4.8 million, again, to communities all across the state. These are your boys and girls clubs, your YMCAs, some rec programs, a lot of those local uh, programs that are serving in their communities. And we anticipate serving about 40,000 students through, the, through that program. Then through the innovation grant, again, the bold innovative ideas, those are awards up to $250,000. We had 41 applicants apply, 36 of them were eligible, and we awarded 25 uh, of those grants. And so a little lower yield rate, about 60%, but still uh, pretty good. And um, you know, making sure that we did get as much money as we could out to communities. That pot of money is about $3.8 million. Uh, we expect that about 56,000 students are gonna be served. So that's an overview, just a, another highlight on the grant program is that we required all awardees to uh, have all their staff complete two hours of social emotional learning training uh, for their staff. And so that's um, being held in conjunction with the after school network of Connecticut. And uh, so where are we at now? We've set up, um, we've awarded the grants or notified the, the awardees about the grants. Now they're getting set up in our grant system online so that way we can get the funds out to these programs. Uh, we're just kind of monitoring from there. We have an email set up for them to answer any questions and providing them um, any, any support as needed. The last important point is around just the message that we've been putting out there for, for communities to leverage funds. And I know the commissioner spoke about this earlier. And so you know, there's municipal funds that are available to uh, rec programs. Obviously, districts have, have uh, ESSER II funds. They have ARP ESSER funds that can be used for summer learning. And then now we have this set-aside money for summer enrichment. So we have, you know, a once-in-a-lifetime moment to give students an amazing summer. And we've been encouraging that also with philanthropy as well. So we've had conversations with the big uh, philanthropic organizations to make sure that they're part of the conversation as well. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Good morning. Good morning. Question. I can't see this from here, so Sorry. you probably it's probably on there. Um, I don't have a hard time. Mm -hmm. What was the average yield of the grant that you gave? And, and secondly, in terms of criteria uh, on the submission, was the number of young people served high on your criteria? as it relates to or connected to the amount of money given? Yeah, so on, on the first question on the yield, in terms of, you're asking about the award amount? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so for the smaller grants, most uh, most uh, organizations ask for the full 25,000. Uh -huh. um, so I would say the average is probably around 20,000. Got yeah. most you for the 25. And then on the innovation side, I would say the average, you know, off the top of my head was probably around 200,000. So they, they could have gotten up to 250. Right. Right. Um, as far as um, how we, we weighted um, certain needs. So this was in some ways dictated by the federal guidelines, ensuring that they're high quality, um, ensuring that certain populations of students were being served um, with, with that priority from the program. And so we weighted that heavily or more heavily in the rubric to ensure that they, the programs that were serving students you know, whether they're L learners, students with disabilities, or students, um, you know, in underserved communities had a higher weight. Thanks. Great. Um, I'm very interested in the innovation grant because I hope we can learn from this. Could you just send us the list of who got those, those grants? Are you, are you on theory, you know, who, who 
go apply for them and then maybe hopefully uh, by the end of the summer or when you're able to see the results you can tell some of the best practices and so on. I also wanted to acknowledge Christopher and I did a panel presentation for Anasi and he really um, put it together you know I just was fortunate enough to, to, to be part of it, to be invited to be part of it. But um, it was very well received and Chris and I offered to do it in Spanish, but they rejected it. They didn't accept our offer to do a bilingual. Uh, so we make sure to work with you. No, likewise. Um, just to, to the point about uh, the innovation grant. So in the in the coming weeks, we, we've talked to the governor's office uh, about highlighting some of these innovative um, programs that we received through application. So more to follow on that. I'm sure you'll see some yeah. Thank you. communication. I just want to see. Yeah. Thank you. Chris, can you speak to the website? Uh, oh, yes. Set up? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so we, you know, we wanted to ensure that, the, so I think we did a great job, you know, in terms of getting the word out to the providers that these, these funds were available. Um, you know, I think on the webinar, we had over 900 people on the call. Um, and then obviously you can see the results of who ended up being eligible to award. But then on the family side, we wanted to make sure that once we made the award, that families knew about all these opportunities uh, that were now available in their communities. And so we worked with um, our contractor that we have now to set up a website called summercc.org. It's live right now. And in that, on that website, you can see all the programs that were funded and uh, you can click on it by region, uh, geography. You know, once you click on a program, you can see if, if, they, you know, if it's free, if there's a sliding scale, uh, if they serve students with disabilities, I mean, there's a bunch of information that we've been working with the vendor on. Uh, it's a pretty slick website that I think is going to be very helpful for families. And that's going to roll into some of the kind of uh, like marketing that we do um, to ensure that families know about these programs. And uh, thank you, Chris, for, for sharing that because uh, I, can, I continue to say now that we build it, we want to make sure we're going to um, and we also know that not all students, all families access websites to get information. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we're really talking about what kind of grassroots efforts, so your ideas and thoughts open and welcome to make sure families have this information. You heard last week, uh, last month, we talked about the learner um, engagement, attendance and engagement program, where folks are probably knocking on doors. I want them to have that information in here that they can share that done directly with families uh, because those are the kinds of things that we need to do. And I said, I don't want families to not know what to do or where to go. I want that information out there. So that's what we'll continue to work on to make sure now that we build it, families know how to access all this great information. And as I said, we know it goes the other website. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I'm sorry, 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 I'm sor
Right. right. You can leverage these dollars through philanthropy to create sustainability in some way. Right. So I was wondering, is, is the philanthropic uh, side, is it a match to the dollars that you are putting out, or how are you putting that together? Yeah, so um, we had a great conversation yesterday with some of the, the philanthropic funders, and you know, to use Desi's quote when he was in a meeting, you know, they, they said, don't bring us in at the end. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Because, you know, obviously we're all concerned about this cliff that potentially can happen. We know that we have these funds for two years. Um, and so but if we're going to create something awesome, right, we want to make sure that we can sustain that. So um, the conversations are pretty, um, you know, they're preliminary right now yeah. in terms of what it's going to look like. But I think the most important part is that they feel valued that they're in the conversation now. And not going to have to come in on the end and say, "Oh, well, this federal money's gone. Now just fill the gap because we can't afford not to have it." And then you just add to that, um, Eric, such a great point because the meeting yesterday came about after with the governor, myself, and others met with PCM uh, and to talk about so that they could get a sense of what the art of the dollars were. <laughs> Uh, and the concept that we need to be working together. Mm -hmm. And so how do we leverage not only, and, and uh, philanthropy was in the room, so yesterday's meeting uh, that I convened was again with CCM, with us, with Kate, uh, with CAP. We're all in the room saying, this is something we've got to do together in this moment. And so we are indeed working together to talk about how do we leverage funding and support. And so we have dollars here. The district have dollars. Right, the local uh, municipalities do, and then philanthropy. How do we bring all this together for sustainability? And the staff have heard me say, let's not think about a funded clip, but let's think about a parachute at the end of that, right? That we're going to use right. to get to where we are, knowing that we can now leverage and fund what works. And so that really is the conversation that we're having. And it is this moment that I think we cannot afford uh, to wait. And Eric, as you said, and it's stabilized. And that's the approach that we truly are taking here, that education is a part of a larger picture when we think about the success of our students and our families. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I had a question, actually, a comment for Charlene when you had said you know, we want to make sure our, you know, our folks talk. Um, the food programs last year were so very successful over the summer. Is there any thoughts of connecting these kind of programs <laughs> through them? Because um, we saw that across the state that you know kids really knew where to go, where to pick up their program, you know their, their food for the day, for the week, whatever. And um, I'm guessing yeah. John, there's still a reach continuing. Yeah. Correct. Maybe that is a connection to make because parents have gotten very used to exactly where they have to go to pick up, and then maybe have information about these programs in there. Absolutely, our libraries. Libraries. Again, that we talk about where are those touch points that we know families can go. Mm -hmm. Talk to the governor about the free program for transportation. How does that connect? Mm -hmm. uh, even on on the weekend, in terms of where folks can go. So that is the, the work uh, to be able to to not just issue the grants as Chris talked about, but to make sure that there's impact. Right. Even registration centers, those are already up and running. The districts are registering kids that are coming from out of another district, uh, going into kindergarten, entering the district for the first time, those places, very often parents will reach out to those folks as well, so that might be another outlet as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, yeah, so on deck, um, update uh, for Kathy on our, our ESSA funding and where we are. <laughs> That looks like it's so <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually does. <laughs> um, good morning, board members. Good morning. Good morning. I have uh, Tanya Butler, who is our fellow, um, actually on virtual, and uh, she's going to. I think we could just speak up a little bit. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> Um, so Tanya is going to kick us off and um, take the first couple slides, and then I will wrap us up. Perfect. Tanya, thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be in community with you again, uh, always with ARP Esser.
but we wanted to just share with you the timeline kind of as a roadmap of where we've been in the last few weeks and where we're going in the next few days and weeks. Uh, so at this point, the LEAs and the school districts, they have submitted their assurances, received their funds and begun their application process. So it's been a very, very busy few weeks since we saw you at the beginning of May. Um, they are also very diligently working on their safe return to in-person instruction plans. They've been given a template, they've been given input as well as a webinar. Uh, and so that's coming up on June 23rd. In just a few weeks, they're required to post that publicly. But uh, very much in the very middle of this timeline is five days away, the big deadline, at least for the State Department, is our state plan that's submitted to um, the U.S. Department of Education. And so that's just five days away. And we have been working tirelessly and every single person in the department has had their eyes or hands or thoughts on it at some point. Um, and so we're just in that final rounds of edits this week. Um, Kathy's gonna share a little bit of insight into some of the things that are included in it. But we also just wanted to take a moment to one, thank you again for the special meeting that you had with us a few weeks ago to provide your input, but then also share a little bit of what we heard from the public. So in the last month, we've conducted two public forums um, where we had over 150 attendees representing teachers to parents to business leaders to members of school boards uh, and received a lot of great information and feedback from them. We also received 50 written comments into a special inbox that we created um, as well as what we received from you. So if we go to the next slide, we just wanted to share a few high level takeaways uh, from the public feedback that we received. Uh, the first was a big ask to continue to share best practices across districts and states. There were some folks that were really, really pleased with what happened this year and others who weren't. Uh, and so this asked to make sure that we were sharing best practices. Social, emotional, mental and behavioral health supports. This has come up all throughout the morning. The students mentioned it as well. Everybody wants to make sure that this is included in the ARPS or spending. Engaging families and communities and doing so in an authentic way. Uh, it seemed to become pretty apparent that folks didn't necessarily feel like they always had a voice at the table. And so it's been the, the commissioner's goal for us to figure out how to make sure that happens and how do we make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on, even if it's not just on the website. Supporting districts and planning for and building safer schools. There was a lot of concern that the infrastructure is not prepared for a life after COVID, if you will professional development for teachers, um, as well as sort of those social, emotional, and mental supports for teachers. So these came across uh, in all different ways, written in the public forums and as well as with you all. So um, thank you again for your input. Kathy's now gonna dump, just jump into the areas in which we thought about spending the state level funding. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Ah. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tanya. So, one of the things, actually, I just want to um, preface this conversation about funding priorities is uh, that we have, the state has been able to reserve funding from each of the tranches of federal ESSER funding that have come to uh, Connecticut. Uh, so the federal law allows us to reserve 10% at the state level for state activities. And that is actually what we're describing in this plan is um, how we're going to best utilize the state activities and the state funding to maximize and funding at the local level and to fill gaps. Um, so a lot of the work that we are putting into our art ESSER planning in the terms of how we will spend it is actually going to carry on work that began in ESSER 1 and um, to continue through ESSER 2. So as we've learned, um, we've adjusted our thinking in terms of what we would dedicate funding towards, but we've also um, committed additional resources to some things that we thought were um, impactful. An example of that would be um, we launched not long ago after an RFP process um, some online curriculum uh, credit recovery. It's Apex Learning and Define Learning are the software packages, um, but they provide supplemental educational um, opportunities for students. So they're not to replace what's going on in the classroom, but they do provide all of our districts statewide with um, something else that they can have available for their students. So we will, something like that, we're planning to extend those contracts to continue to have those resources available so districts don't have to invest in them. Um, so I think that's a good example of 
our continued thinking. Also around, um, we've dedicated a significant amount of funding and effort to towards uh, compensatory education, towards our special education population. And we're looking at how to match that um, and further that in, with our art ESSER money. So the initiative buckets that are being considered and you look at it and then we were, the interesting thing is as we were discussing this, we were thinking, well, you know, are they too many buckets? You know, should we uh, try and uh, class them? But I think all of these are important concepts and are worthy of being um, considered individually. So the commissioner's commitment to social, emotional, and mental health support is one of the guiding um, ways, things that we've been thinking about um, how to utilize the state funds that are completely discretionary. And I'll back up really quickly, I apologize. Of the $110 million of our ESSER funding, as I mentioned at one of our prior board meetings, we have to commit $55 million of it to learning loss. So that comes off the top. We have another $11 million that goes to the summer enrichment programming that Chris just spoke to. And then we have another $11 million that will be um, coming out later this year for after school programming and innovative and new ideas and enrichment there. So all of that had come off the top, which did leave us with a balance of money. And so some of what you're, we're talking about here is really how we're going to utilize that balance of funding. Um, so again, I think the, some of the things that we've learned through the data that has uh, the department has been collecting and through whether through surveys or through data that's collected in the GEEP's office is, um, you know, how do we do some things to do uh, engagement of our high schoolers? You know, not for students who have lost credit or, you know, are, may not be progressing naturally to the next grade. Um, you know, how do we help them and how do we get them re-engaged very quickly because with graduation right around the corner, um, you know, we don't want to lose any of um, There will be the commitment of $11 million towards innovative and at, um, after school programming. It is possible, depending upon what some of the proposals that we end up getting look like, that even we could commit additional extra funding to that work. Um, I think that will be a critical opportunity to help students catch up um, and provide some of that one-on-one -on -one tutoring and um, social emotional supports that may not be possible during the, the school day, but you know, extending their school day. Uh, AGE has um, set up a group of higher education, um, a collaborative with a number of our universities to do some research. So we are committing um, some funding to actually researching the impacts of COVID, the impacts of the programming that we're offering, um, taking a look and seeing essentially what we've learned from what's happened and how we can move forward best. Uh, the, the commissioner never fails to remind me, we have to make sure that family and community <laughs> partnerships are a key focus of what we do, and um, so we are committed to working on that. And then with the talent office, uh, we've been working on ideas around educator support, um, continued recruitment, recruitment in of diverse candidates, recruitment in teacher shortage areas. Um, you know, how, what can we do to support the field and maximize the, uh, these funds to address some of the priorities of the board? Um, Another area is post-secondary access, our adult education and credit recovery. Uh, again, I know that during the course of the session and as the commissioner has been out and around the state, um, one of the things that has continued to rise to um, our, her level are, you know, how do we make sure the students, uh, our high school students are accessing, um, whether it be through completion of FAFSA, post-secondary opportunities, um, getting the credit recovery necessary to access it, and then how do we attempt to um, help our adult population in ensuring that they have opportunities to complete their GED or 
um, for career training. The last two categories, which is they're not actually the last two, <laughs> I was just looking at on the list, are students with disabilities and our English learners. Um, we plan on submitting a, a significant amount of funding to addressing um, how to accelerate these students' learning, how to help recover um, what they may have lost from um, the impact of not being in school and being learning remotely. And you know, how do we best engage their families and their communities in supporting these students, uh, along with making sure that their schools have significant um, extra support during the school day to help their recovery. And I am happy to answer any questions or if I um, miss something, Commissioner, please feel free. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I really just wanted to say that, you know, we truly are continuing to listen to our partners and listen to stakeholders and listen to you uh, as well uh, as we continue to do this, this planning, keeping in mind that districts have $995 million uh, with some requirements there as well. And so we're also making sure, looking at that, right, and making sure that we're able to uh, address gaps and also Something that we have to recall, we have um, districts that are getting $100 million, and we have districts getting uh, $69,000. $69, <laughs> right? So we also have to look to think about how to provide support in that in that manner as well. Yeah. Um, thank you again for a very thorough review. And I'm, I'm being optimistic because I think a lot of good things are going to come out of it. My, my, I've been thinking whether I should say or not, you know, I've, I've said so many things in this meeting that it doesn't matter if I have one more. Um, one of the challenges is to spend too much time reviewing what happened, the pathology of what happened, and not, again, using the opportunity to move forward and advance. So it's a balance. You have to look at what has happened. But I think we all know, I mean, the student presentations, they were magnificent in identifying the things that need to be done and so on and so forth. So I would caution you when you put your lenses to, again, not dwell uh, heavily on the pathology and the, you know, autopsy of what happened, but more on what is doable, what can happen, and how do we move forward? Because that, I think the funding is for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair, I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that we have uh, managed to set up in um, partnership with CAPS and through, we engaged um, Ellen Stoltz, who I think you may have met on um, uh, one of our board meetings, is, and then our internal technical assistance team, is actually a means of um, connecting and sharing best practices. So literally a review of the ESSER 2 applications right. um, for innovative practices are being, they're calling it spark innovation, <laughs> um, but they, there is actually uh, technical assistance going on with the CAPS technical advisors for districts along with uh, supportive webinars, uh, calling out things that we are seeing that um, we think are meaningful right. and sharing that information. So I think we agree totally that this is our opportunity to do things differently, or if not differently, then maybe in a more impactful way. Um, and one of the things we have stood up is a system of being able to share um, those best practices in a way that I don't think that we um, have done before. Thank you. Kathy, how long the district, I, I didn't realize, amounts of money were so large. How long did the districts have to use this money? So there are three tranches of funding. Can you, can you speak louder? Sure. There are three tranches of funding. Um, ESSER 1 goes all the way through September 30th of 2022. Um, ESSER 2 
which they just completed their applications in April 4, those funds are available through September 30th of 2023. Our ESSER, which is what we are submitting our plan here for, those funds are available through September 30th of 2024. Um, so it is going to be very important for our districts that are, you know, over the course of those three funding sources will receive somewhere close to $200 million, um, you know, to plan for how they're going to expend those additional funds. And that is part of the technical assistance and support that um, the or the ESSER technical advisor team is also providing to them. But for this particular pot of funds, they have through September 30th, 2024. Okay, so they have enough time to actually plan and use it wisely, not just to disperse it. That is our hope and our, <laughs> and the that we're providing. our application is designed to support that. Um, so that is something that, you know, we have been very thoughtful about in helping them plan. Eric, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't even ask this. <laughs> can you connect um, the money that is earmarked certain districts with the districts that are on the racial imbalance list? Meaning, could there be some type of way to um, uh, Inspired districts who have been on the racial imbalance list for, for some years <laughs> and connect that to the money that is earmarked for them. Is that lawful? So while we cannot, um, as long as an activity that they want to spend the funding on is an eligible activity, then the department is not in a position to say no. However, what we are able to do, and part of what um, we are sharing through with districts as things they should consider um, as they do their applications, is uh, questions of equity and access. And um, those conversations, and we actually have applications where districts have committed to having um, racial equity conversations community-wide as part of their planning. So those activities are happening, and what we'll do is we will make those activities available as, to everybody and let them know that these are, you know, talk to your colleagues. These are some um, things that we are seeing that I think will be meaningful. and. Um, so while as long as they're spending the funding on an activity that's eligible, you know, we thank you, Eric. I think you, you know, you're a light bulb when I think maybe we can get some sort of um, a connection between how to be, you know, like we do with the accountability committee with the schools that are part of the commission network and all that. How are they Using the funding pool, let's say, you know, you can instead of working in silos, since this is something that we care about, is there a way to put it? I know, I do understand that you know, money goes to not to school, but is there a way in funding to connect the two issues so we can see what's happening? We don't see all, all the racial impacts, but how is the funding being used? I'm just asking the question. I know I gave it to you, you probably took his. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want another report, but I think it's a very valid perspective, and it would help us also to enhance uh, a, this very important topic. So I've, I've, I've made a note of that. Uh, it, I think you're asking about some levels of intentionality uh, around exactly. um, or nudging or whatever the, the terminology that we want to use. So, so thank you for putting that on, for putting that on. Uh, before us, I think it's something that we need to, to have some time to Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah I mean, Thank because we're, we're rewarding districts who are actually breaking the law. Exactly. With money. And, and although the, the two probably don't have much to do with each other, um, there's something, to me, there's a moral dilemma there mm -hmm. um, that I just wanted to interrogate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all. Much appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> that connection. 
opportunities to incentivize. Yeah. Yeah. I like the fire. How long have we seen the Kimberly School in front of us? So, so thank you for that. And thanks, Kathy. And um, I'm sensitive to time. Uh, and I wanted to do a quick update on the, your board plan development. So, Keith, uh, if you could just do that briefly for us, that would be great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am uh, reaching back to my college years where I used to scream across the lacrosse field. So hopefully everybody can hear me. If you can't, let me know. Keep, keep screaming loud. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of us have bigger ears than we did in your college years. <laughs> well, I think what I have not yet mastered is how to speak to a mask with glasses on. <laughs> so if I stop to take them off to read. <laughs> Um, so very exciting times uh, for for us and for the Connecticut Center for School Change. Uh, Richard Lemons had a fantastic afternoon uh, with all of you during the, the retreat that we had several weeks ago. Uh, took dozens, literally dozens of pages of notes, brought it back to his team uh, who are energized and excited about assisting in uh, preparing this plan. They've even recruited uh, interns from the University of Connecticut uh, that are excited to join the team and, and help uh, create a very, very dynamic document. Just a really quick update. I know we're getting upon the, the mean hour. Um, the second phase, preparing for the stakeholder engagement. Uh, which is really input and information gathering through the use of focus groups and surveys uh, is upon us and has been uh, going on now. For the focus groups, the Connecticut Center for School Change has created a list of organizations and content, uh, contacts to invite to our focus groups. Uh, they used existing lists as a basis. Uh, from the last plan that the department uh, used uh, when putting together the strategic plan, uh, they've invited suggestions and, and got a good response from agency personnel and, and senior leadership to add to that. Uh, they have invited suggestions from influencers and contacts across the state that the Connecticut Center themselves uh, has and has developed over the years. And finally, they've invited additional suggestions from all of you as well. And a special thank you to those who have uh, responded to LSEML with these suggestions, uh, which are being incorporated into the focus group planning. Um, at the same time, they are um, finishing in the final, final phase of developing the survey that they're going to administer very broadly across the state to touch the thousands that aren't able to join the focus groups. Uh, they have reviewed the past surveys used by the department and by the board and past strategic plan. They have reviewed stakeholder engagement surveys used in other states. And they've also uh, received some guidance provided by the individual interviews that uh, Richard conducted with all of you and in the spring retreat to help inform the survey questions. And that survey is in its final stages of development. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, next steps, uh, at, through the end of May, uh, which we've just uh, finished, and June, which is now upon us, they are, the, the Connecticut Center is finalizing the focus group invitation list. Uh, they will be inviting stakeholders to the focus groups, which will occur throughout the summer. They will finalize the survey instrument and the Connecticut Center will work with the department to disseminate the survey widely across the state. Uh, June and July, uh, they will be conducting the actual focus groups in earnest. And through the end of July, beginning of August, they will be analyzing and summarizing the findings from the focus groups in the surveys. And they're literally uh, prepared and uh, expecting thousands and thousands of results from surveys. Um, and they will be summarizing these four 
our board retreat that we will be having in July. Um, and we will be choosing a place. We, we heard what you are, uh, we mentioned at the last retreat, it will be in person. Um, and out of respect for your appetite and out of abundance of respect for my friend that I share, there will be food provided. Um, and to keep the, the brain going and, and keep us all thinking and good food, <laughs> good, food. <laughs> good food, not just food, good food, absolutely. Um, and that's where we are, and, and that will be a great opportunity for you all to go through the findings, to have another robust discussion. Richard will be there himself, uh, as long as some of, as well as some of his associates and interns um, and uh, members of the SV staff. And that is where we stand for immediate next steps. The question is the last thing you talk about the retreat date being determined. I know that the August 4th, uh, at least on our calendar, the August 4th is the retreat date. Mm -hmm. Is that going to not be that day? You know, what I'm going to do is uh, speak to Richard because what I don't want to do is. is retreat before all of the information has been um, uh, analyzed and, and prepared for dissemination. So I'm going to speak with Richard this week to make sure that everything can be done by August 4th and there shouldn't be a problem with that. If that's not the case, we'll quickly reach out to you. you know, some of us have kind of planned our whole summer around. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So could you just let Richard know the date? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and perhaps We'll do a survey and maybe that it shouldn't be. You know, but I don't know. I you know, I for one have got everything planned about around to be here on that day, but if it changes, I just need I like to know as soon as sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll make sure that, that happens. Uh, thank you. Yeah. All right, keep moving along. Uh I just uh, have a question about the uh, retreat, not about the five year plan that are at our retreat in August, is it just the five-year plan that will be on the agenda, or are we going to have other items that we have in the past on the agenda, or is it just for our five-year plan? Plan so we don't have the will of the board. That's what we'll do with the board. I just it just occurred to me that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good to know. I mean, my right. understanding was it was for just this. Yeah, so it, it really is our five-year plan, not really our board retreat. Yeah, it would just be good to know so we can kind of get. I, I, for the newer board members, we used to have a retreat that was um, an right. agenda, and we would go through many different items um, that the board engaged in, not just one Very, item. For preliminary conversations that I have with them. Just begin to think about it. Was that the, uh, she reminded me of the strategic plan? But I also we also talk about the board hasn't really made the first, right. you know. So this was an opportunity to maybe as the time, depending on the agenda, to have you know some bonding uh, opportunity and also perhaps ask, especially the newer board members, uh, that doesn't exclude any of us. Right. What issues are there? You know, do we need to the next year? You know, what is it on their mind? What is it that is not clear? What is it some sort of clarifying? Uh, but that's not fixed. It's just a conversation. Okay. And uh, I do think it's uh, eating is always a bonding opportunity. So mm -hmm. that you have to know that we should. Um, but you know, to me that would be, from my perspective, that was an important outcome of this retreat. That uh, getting to know each other better, interacting with each other. Is, is there a location? No, there's no location. We yeah. talk about um, in prior years when we first uh, done retreats. We have done retreats in very different places. I mean, in school, in um, in uh, yeah, uh, and, and so on. But we have met also at the old state house right here. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was very appropriate. You know, that was a you know, they have a large mini room and it's closed with a five feet on walk over there. So we have talked about looking at that, but nothing has to be said. How they have to work with the commissioner, so with the chair, in terms of the, the position. 
uh, of a variance period. So we may well have the August retreat, but that may be different than this. No, no, no. It, it will be the focus will be the strategic plan. But if there's an opportunity, but well, you know, then the other things. I always think whenever we convene, it's an opportunity to ask board members, right. you know, what what is it that they are concerned about? What, what are they? So we may have an August meeting on the fourth, in addition to the retreat, whatever that is. Yes. No, she no, just the August fourth would be August fourth, for two, the retreat. The agenda may be this or this plus what I'm doing, but but not separate. Okay. Right. No question. Charlie. You know I understand why the microphones are not here. This, meet, this part of the meeting has been very frustrating to me because I'm hearing every third or fourth word. Uh, you know, my ears are not that great anymore. And uh, what do we have planned going forward? And Don, thank you. I've been having exactly the same thing. I mean, this, this is crazy. So I, I will apologize. I mean, look, we are doing our best here to navigate no. multiple different things here. Part of the issue last month was with so many people being remote, we we could not control the, the bandwidth and the internet connections that are external to us. So that was part of, of the issue. We had the microphones in the room last week that worked for us in the room, but no one on the stream could hear it because it was causing so much interference. So we're, we're trying to to figure out the right balance here, it, it, it's a little messy, and, and I, I, it may be for a little while. So I would just, you know, encourage everybody at this point where we are, we're just going to have to try to do a better job of speaking up so that everybody can hear. Because if we bring the microphones back and we exclude the viewing public from being able to, to hear anything because of the, the, the sensitivity of the microphones that are in the ceiling. So it's, it's definitely a work in progress, and, and we will continue to keep working. Yeah, I, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand you, you're up against uh, technology uh, constraints. But I'm talking about when the audience is here in the fall, if they're due to come back. Um, you know, to so, start. yeah, hopefully we'll be back to <laughs> yeah. being able to have everything yeah. here. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just not yeah. hearing anything. Right. The, the ideal situation is what it was before. We would have CTN, they would come in, we would stream, we would have the microphone, so it, it worked. So that is obviously what we'd like to get back to. It just may take a little bit longer to get there. Yeah, no, I, I do understand um, what Don, you are saying, and I'm, I'm going to talk louder. Um, Thank you. But Don, I don't know, we can talk to Ali, it may be by sitting you in, in a different place, you can hear better. Like sometimes, you know, that's part of what happens. Um, I it, know also, it also depends on who's sitting in that seat. Exactly. I, mean, I heard you loud and clear. Kathy, I hear nothing. I know. So, <laughs> you know. Kathy was never a teacher. <laughs> huh? Kathy was never a teacher. No. No, it's got to do with frequency, frequency of the voice yeah. You know, yeah. and high notes disappear from those of us with hearing yeah. problems. Yeah, especially, I know from my husband uh, that he doesn't hear women, he doesn't hear me. It's not gender specific, my wife doesn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> is, the, is, the, uh, is the retreat considered a public meeting and no. in this same uh, format? The retreat is public, but we will consider a public meeting. The retreat is public. The, 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 fact, the, the fact that we meet makes it public. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not secret. If we met secretly, we will be in jail. Yeah. But is it going to be the same kind of a setup where we can't hear? <laughs> <laughs> and we've never had. We've had the press that I can recall once. Well, we know, right. and they right. stayed very shortly. We, we always they give, were give notice that an agenda that doesn't really attract a lot of people to come, yeah. and we can have real conversations. But. 
don't know if we're going to be able to do that this year. But uh, yeah, no, very, very little interest in attending our retreats in past years, other than for board members. So I am quickly moving us along. I know Dave has got some additional updates. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Uh, and I also am sensitive of our time, so Dave is going to get us there. So this is to give you a, a sense of where we ended up last week with our, our, our learning model. Um, 86, yeah, 86 yeah. of our um, kids were, were fully in. Uh, we still have a couple of districts that are moving in between that and, and hybrid. But you can see overall the trend line um, for the year. And I just want to give a, a, another shout out to the, the performance office and the amount of, of work that went into setting up the, not only the learning model as a weekly collection, but also um, the attendance rate model. They've done a phenomenal job and provided us with significant data um, in the middle of a pandemic that we've been able to, to act on. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Thank Next you. slide. Uh, so John is going to quickly just share and, and um, just an update. Speak it loudly. Yes, sure. <laughs> You spoke for her a lot about our guidance and the efforts we've been making to keep sort of up with what is necessary to help provide technical assistance and advice to our school districts as we've navigated the past year. So we just wanted to let you know that some of the most recent uh, pieces of guidance that we've provided are the summer school enrichment opportunities um, guidance. We, we answered some questions, I think, in that guidance around what is the difference between some of the public health implementation rules if you're in a school building versus an outdoor camp, um, and obviously working with our colleagues at Office of Early Childhood to ensure that it was clear that um, these were sort of setting-based rules, depending on whether you were in a school, a camp, an overnight camp, or um, something in between. You know, you heard Chris Soto provide some information about the innovations that we're expecting. So we just wanted to acknowledge that there may be some different settings this summer than what we are traditionally seeing where students are coming together. And so we worked with uh, Department of Public Health to make sure we had updated that, as well as the, um, it, you know, informed our, our schools about the updated guidance around support. Um, there was a, a significant update that you're all familiar with about uh, use of maps from the CDC in the past month since we last convened. And um, shortly after the initial gui uh, guidance came out from the CDC, there was an update confirming that the expectation for at least the rest of the school year was that masks would continue to be universally worn, uh, particularly since we know we have populations where many of our students are not yet eligible for vaccination. So we did uh, make sure that it was clear for all of our districts that there's a continuing mandate for universal mask wearing and that that is supported both by the governor's executive order, which supports our guidance on the topic, as well as by the Department of Public Health order, which specifies where do you not wear a mask if you're vaccinated and where do you need to wear a mask if you're vaccinated. Um, and similarly, we have some questions that arose around what did the new CDC guidance around vaccinated folks and mask wearing mean for and school year activities, so for proms and graduation and for other kind of, you know, transition events. And so we also, you know, made sure that we provided some additional feedback to our schools around continued recommendations for sort of uh, the least likelihood of transition in some of those events, but acknowledging that, you know, basically the rules are consistent with what, they, what you're familiar with out in the sector, that, that the rules for these events is um, similar to what you would see in, in other, particularly outdoor venues, which we know a lot of our districts are looking towards to have, hold their end of school year events. Um, I think that covers it. And, um, you know, the second bullet there, again, is sort of assumed in, in our guidance where we just made sure that folks were aware of what information is being put out now that there was this somewhat sudden and evolving. Um, you know, change in approach from the CDC on vaccinated folks and use of masks. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, John Prasnelli, for the remainder of the slide. All right, thank you. So, uh, brief update on vaccinations and the testing programs that are happening. Um, as you know, in April, the Pfizer vaccine was approved for uh, children ages 16 uh, and 17. Uh, that was a change from age 18. And then last month, that extended to children aged uh, 12, 50. So the Department of Public Health has been working with districts to, to set up uh, tests, uh, vaccine clinics all over. Um, School-based clinics have numbered approximately
approximately 250 to close to 300 school specific clinics for vaccinations across the state. That's been coupled by large scale vaccination events that you probably heard of at Rentula Field and, and uh, health departments have done some uh, sort of splashy uh, vaccination things with music and to entice uh, students to come uh, and get vaccinated. So we've reached about uh, close to 60% of 15 and 17 year olds at this time have been received their first vaccination. Uh, about 34% of uh, 12 to 15 year olds have received their first dose of vaccination. Um, and uh, virtually, uh, they started targeting alliance districts at the beginning in April, and virtually every, actually every alliance district has had at least one uh, school specific clinic for vaccination. So uh, that continues to be ongoing, uh, and the vaccination continues. Um, with regard to testing, we have two uh, COVID 19 testing programs in Connecticut. One is called the ICAP, the uh, Increasing Community Access Testing, which is a specific Department of Health and Human Services program where we were uh, invited, I guess, to provide uh, some, some high-need districts to the federal government for them to identify where they would support that testing. Uh, they chose uh, Waterbury and Haven. They are partnering with Rite Aid pharmacies now, and we anticipate that the testing is going to start this week. Um, and that's all happening. A separate program under the Centers for Disease Control. The uh, Department of Public Health receives $107 million to do school-based testing. That is ongoing. The plan was to do a pilot program in the spring. That's happening with seven districts who are participating in that pilot who are doing what we call event-based testing. So testing for prom, uh, testing for uh, graduation, testing for sports, testing for other events in the fall, uh, in the spring rather, occurring now. There, we will open up that opportunity in the summer, uh, the summer enrichment programming, uh, municipal and district-based programs will have the opportunity for either weekly or bi-weekly testing or event-based testing that will be happening. And then uh, further rollout, uh, sort of a big push will happen in the prior to fall with regard to uh, testing availability for those actually under age 12 in the focus area to get that uh, because we're hoping that we anticipate that most of the 12-year-olds and up will be vaccinated at that point. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, and I know that um, we'll continue to update you on what's going on in, in that space. And next month, we'll talk a little bit more about the vision and plans for our mental health support and social emotional effort uh, in using our funds coupled with uh, others uh, who are part of that work with us. All right. Thank you, Jesse. I think there's uh, one more there for John. It's just an update on uh, training coming up. Yeah, uh, this is a, a webinar, part of our webinar series uh, and our push to, to talk directly to families. This is a webinar that occurred uh, last week around home visiting. It, it, again, it's, it's two-pronged. Our, our focus on, uh, we've provided dozens of webinars specific for families in addition to the work that we're doing in district. Uh, it also highlights uh, the, the initiative of parent-teacher home visiting, which we are spearheading in a number of, a number of areas, not including the the LEAP program, which you have heard about here, the Learner Engagement and Attendance Program, the hallmark of that is the is evidence-based parent-teacher home visiting. So all of that to say that we're continuing that, that work. Thanks. Debbie, take us home. <laughs> so next slide, please. Uh, two additional resources that we recently uh, rolled out are both Apex Learning and Define Learning. As Kathy mentioned earlier, uh, these are part of our ESSER 1. Um, they set aside funds that we were able to uh, do an RFP. These are to provide supplemental resources to districts. We've done a series of, of uh, webinars uh, at the end of May, including uh, with superintendents so that they are aware of the resource and how to use it. Um, those webinars are now uh, posted in the Learning Hub as we continue to roll out additional resources across the state. Next slide. So almost a year ago, we partnered and, yeah. with. Don't we got to yeah. the Okay, almost a year ago, we partnered with the Rest Alliance um, when we launched the Connecticut Plan for Reimagining uh, Connecticut Classrooms. And we wanted to put professional learning, timely professional learning, in the hands of teachers, which was to promote, to promote blended learning in the classroom, um, regardless of location. So with the Rest Alliance, um, it was at no cost to districts. Any educator could participate in seven blended learning modules. And we celebrated those teachers on May 20th as impact educators. Next slide, please. So as a result of all that professional 
learning, the educators on this slide were recognized as recognize having a significant impact not only on their schools and their colleagues with the students, and we will continue to use them as part of the networking and hope that we can expand this impact educator program with the REST Alliance. Yeah. All right. So the next three slides speak to some of the supports in the turnaround office in particular for this uh, past month. What you will notice throughout all three of them is just the sheer effort from not only the offices within the agency, but folks in the field and partners um, throughout the state and even national partners to support our turnaround districts and schools. So next staff happened on May 14th, and we continued with the theme of leading with persistence. Um, and thank everyone that is on that slide for their support. Next slide. This next opportunity um, was specific to Commissioner's Network Schools, and we partnered with Education Elements, a national partner, and it is for the principals and assistant principals, along with the turnaround office consultant. So it's, we're working side by side, learning side by side on how to better and more efficiently work as a team, as opposed to individuals. So that is a four session series between May and August. Next slide. And lastly is our charter school leaders, um, uh, Estella and the uh, Probability and Support Committee can attest to the um, progress made around certification and charters, and we wanted to leverage that. So in working with the talent office, we conducted a session for charter leaders around certification, team, hiring, retention, and so forth. Um, so we were really proud of that, and it was, it was a great opportunity to engage with the charters on that work. So next, I would like to bring up Carol Dibble. Wonderful. So for those of you that do not know Carol, she is our teacher in residence in the turnaround office for the past two years. I want to start off by thanking Superintendent Moore from West Harker Public Schools for the partnership and sharing his top talent with us over the past two years. A teacher in residence is truly an opportunity, not only for the district and the actual teacher in residence, but also us as an agency. It brings ground level experience to the agency and a very fresh perspective. And so, needless to say, we are very um, enthused and appreciative of Carol's service over the past two years. I also want to acknowledge Carol's family who is watching the live stream today, um, supporting her as well. As well as the turnaround office colleagues who have worked with her over the past two years. Um, I just want to mention just a couple of things. Uh, she has worked tremendously with district and school leaders over the past two years on improvement plans, developing professional learning cycles, coaching cycles, facilitated numerous walkthroughs. She's collaborated with numerous offices in the agency, as well as external partners provides wraparound support for the district and schools we work with. She has been a driving force in the expansion of our turnaround efforts to support our districts and schools. In particular, um, led and coordinated the newly developed Commissioner's Network Summer Institute and the soon to be released need assessment root and cause analysis toolkit with another consultant in the office. She has truly been an asset to not only the districts and schools, but to the agency. And for that, we are thankful. The agency thanks you. I thank you. And just thank you all for, for the opportunity to recognize Carol's work. And we have a recognition certificate for Carol. Oh, so she can have that. Is she going back to West Hartford? <laughs> oh, my God. So thank you, Carol. Would you get another teacher in residence? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
So, board members, I hope there's no fatigue in our agency updates. We try to make sure we bring lots of information to you so that you know the work of the agency that we're engaged in and we'll continue to keep you informed. So, thank you very much. I did ask so Laura is probably going to be up 24 7 for the next few days while session uh, is ending, but she's been doing a phenomenal job. Uh, just watching all the pieces of legislation there and keeping us surprised. Anything to say here? Uh, I mean, sure, I can give a brief update. Everyone, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes, I have been up 24 7 for days on end. Um, and the end is in sight at least. Next Wednesday at midnight, they will be hopefully done um, and not have to go into special session. There's still a negotiations on the budget, which is the big thing right now. And so many of the pending education bills have funding issues. I mean, a lot of them are big spenders. And so two that are still alive that have actually been, I don't know if you've seen, I've been walking in and out all morning because I'm getting phone calls to negotiate bills. Um, two of the really big bills are going to create new entities within the department. Uh, one of them is House Bill uh, 6620, and that's what we're all calling the Right to Read Bill, and it would create a literacy center within the department, um, which we're fully in support of, um, as long as we get the bodies that we need to actually staff up that center. And so we're we're working right now to shore up the language and get it to a place where we're going to make sure that there is funding included in the budget to give us the people that we need. Um, the other one that's creating an office of dyslexia training and compliance within the department. Um, I was actually up negotiating until about 11 last night on this one, I think. Um, and we, we've gotten it to a much better place than where it initially started. This is going to um, be charged with developing compliance measures and audit procedures to determine the compliance of EPP is basically making sure that the folks who are getting certified are actually getting the required coursework through the EPP program. So this one I'm a little more comfortable with because they gave us um, in the appropriations budget $480,000, which is what we asked for for four positions to staff this office. And so they are in ongoing negotiations, obviously, um, still the governor and the legislature, but if that money stays in, then I think we're going to be in a really good place to be able to prop this up. Lastly, I just want to talk really quickly about your bill, um, the, the agency bill 945, which includes all of the, the things that you had voted on back now months and months ago, in December probably, that um, made it out of the education committee with no changes. It had to be sent to the Judiciary Committee, and it, there were no changes there. And then it was passed on the consent calendar in the Senate, so there was no discussion, nobody even talked on it. And so it, it's on the House calendar now. I think it is double started by tomorrow, so it's able to get taken up by tomorrow. I don't anticipate there being any problems with our bill. So, I mean, there's, there we had started this session with 300 bills about, as the Commissioner loves to talk about, it was 300 bills in 19 different committees. Um, and I think I have whittled it down to about a dozen um, that we're actually still negotiating and pushing towards the finish line. So, I mean, that's where we are right now. If anybody has any questions, happy to answer them. And you always know how to get in touch with me. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you for all your work. Laura, what are the essential points in the education bill? In our bill, yes. there were several sections. Um, they pertain to changes to certification, Several of them were changes to certification um, statutes. Um, and then, gosh, now I'm trying to remember. It's been so long since I looked at our bill. Um, nobody has any problems with it, so that's when I never have to pay attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why we didn't look, look at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The part for removing 10-76Q from the statute that was the thing that was um, pertaining to the technical high school um, with the special education students. So that part is in there. Um, Maybe if you could just send us. A yeah, I have a whole summary here. I'm just, I was just trying to quickly pick highlights, but I, I can't. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in here. So what I'll do is I'll send you all 
the OLR report that section by section outlines everything that's in our bill so you can see it. Sure. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Yes. All right, I will do that right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, do so we have anything? Uh, well, that's uh, are there going to be reports? Academic standards? Yeah, standards and assessments. Our next meeting will be next Tuesday, June 8th. Okay. Accountability. We met on May 18th, and um, I want to thank Lisa and Eileen um, for the incredible work they have done. We had Three charter schools that came up for um, to provide uh, their uh, improvement plans, an update on the improvement plans. And the, the first one was probably a reluctant charter school that we had asked them to comply with um, certification, and they did meet a hundred percent certification. It was like outstanding, and they were delighted. We were even more delighted, and I know it's took a lot of support and work and collaboration to make that happen. That was later off uh, charter school in, in Bridgeport. The second um, is Bridge Academy and again improvement in the academics in, in certification. And the last one I said, uh, they did talk about some improvement, but they think findings uh, that came out after the meeting regarding ISAC. So we're going to meet with them July 13, I believe, to hear from them and to uh, ask them uh, to um, detail how they're going to address um, improvement and meeting the accountability piece of the findings and uh, to make sure that they understand that the board is looking at it. So again, thank you to Irene and, and uh, Lisa. And Irene, please don't change your hair though, because then I don't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> I asked did not meet legislation policy. We did not meet. We'll be meeting on July 14th. Okay. Uh, Jeff was in the other room. Uh, I don't know where he went. There he is. He also changed his shirt. He was on deck circle out there. <laughs> You're up, You're up Jeff. Jeff. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a couple of quick updates from our CTEX board meeting from last month. Uh, fiscally, we were excited, the board was excited to finalize an agreement with Three Rivers Community College, which agreed to waive all tuition and fees during the fall and spring semester of every academic year for all of our Grasso Tech students uh, who are currently enrolled there at Grasso Tech. This is based on the uh, partnership that we have with them uh, where Three Rivers is using our our welding lab and our ship fitting lab. So that was uh, some, some uh, great news coming uh, from that partnership with, uh, with higher ed. Just a couple of other quick things. We were excited to have the Lieutenant Governor join uh, several of our board members this past month uh, to open up our new afternoon programming for students uh, at Vinyl Tech in Middletown. And this is a situation where LEA high school students can come in in the afternoons at no charge to the LEA. And they can get career technical education at our schools uh, and receive high school credit or receive work-based learning uh, internship opportunities as well. So we're really proud of uh, these partnerships with the, with the various local districts. Uh, we also were excited that we successfully fully opened our, our schools uh, this past month, um, reestablishing our expectations and norms, preparing, uh, you know, it was really important for us to get all of our kids the opportunity to come back full time at the end of the school year so we can reset our, you know, our routines and our transitions for the kids at the end of the year. 
couple of quick uh, student success celebrations. Two Plat, student, Plat Tech students from Milford in the Sustainable Architecture Program participated in a national competition called Space Set, where they acted as architects on hypothetical projects to build an international space station. And this is the same shop that actually constructed a part that's on the real space station uh, up above us right now. And this Friday, Vinyl Tech High School students in the Criminal Justice and Protective Services Program will receive a state and federal recognition for their work during the COVID-19 pandemic. The recognition comes after students twice activated their emergency operations center that's located right in the school uh, in Vinyl Tech in Middletown to support deployed federal medical response teams in California and Wyoming. So that was a, a summary of uh, this past month's board. That's questions. Bob? No, any questions? Thanks, Jeff. Jeff, Jeff, I'm just curious. How the students in a tech school classroom can Connecticut support the deployed troops? And it's in California, right? So this this, this uh, particular shop, uh, the emergency management shop, has uh, the, somewhat somewhat similar to this. So uh, has a uh, an operations center with TVs and, and uh, connections to the media, and uh, you know they learn how to become you know they're they're learning how to become uh, one of many different emergency uh, response roles, whether it's uh, EMTs, police, fire but also uh, dispatchers, you know, so they work in uh, learning uh, how, to, how to work a dispatch center as well. So they were in there uh, under the guidance of, uh, you know, the teachers working to uh, support, you know, crisis management around the country. So it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. Yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, you don't really have to be in the, you don't have to be there uh, to do that kind of work. It's, it's really terrific. It's, I, it's, it's, uh, we used to have a command center to the hospital too. And they were in the basement, everybody else was somewhere else. Uh -huh. And uh, it always took me home. It took me home when I was these kids to see these kids in action. They're great. Thank you. Ask me anything. There was a meeting of the Government Affairs Committee yesterday. And one thing that was interesting, uh, the uh, person from North Carolina mentioned how their legislature is uh, trying to pass a bill to prevent, you know, teaching about the uh, unpleasant aspects of our country's history, and uh, they're trying to prevent that uh, legislation. I know a number of states are, are uh, trying to do that sort of thing. And uh, I mentioned our first in the nation uh, course in Black and Latino history, which they found interesting. Yeah. yeah. Sixteen states goes on out there. Sixteen states are trying to present this. Wow. And last on the list here, Zerk. Thank you, Woody. I just wanted to add to Nancy to. Um, my study group has come to a close. Actually, my final report is due this week. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate Estella and Chris um, holding that webinar. Um, it was so well received, and Nasby was just thrilled. I talked to Megan a couple of times and just thrilled that we got Connecticut on there. I know it was not an easy thing, especially I looked at Chris, to do in the middle of all of the work that you've done. But it was um, excellent, and uh, a lot of people have called in and asked questions about it. So they were very pleased. They, when I started the study group over a year ago, they asked, kept asking about Connecticut, Connecticut, Connecticut. And she said, we're not going to let you go until we get to see a webinar. So I had to go study Stella. <laughs> I felt it should be leadership to be on there. So thank you for that. Um, and at the same time, I, I just want to take the opportunity before I get the search report to really thank all of our staff here. I wanted to do that early when Shirley was finishing, but you just have been wonderful. And it's and continue to be wonderful. And I, uh, we are very lucky to get the updates that we get from all of you. So I thank you very much for that. I know how hard you all work. It's so nice to see you here, actually. Not on the screen. <laughs>
I'm going to quickly go over CERT and all this. I can give me a written one, so I'm going to give it to you afterwards. Um, just some of the things that they continue to do. The biggest thing is their special ed training that CERT is going to be involved in. Um, 2021 pilot districts for next year and then forever, you know, for all the districts after that, as well as a lot of different departments of the agency that they are uh, working with. Uh, I reported out that they still are continuing to get many um, professional learning requests, um, and most of them based on racial um, racial professional development. So that is still a continuous. And um, so what do you point to? is the collaboration with the agency over the newly curriculum for the Black and Latino. That's an update for certain all the topics you do. Thank you. Anything else? I guess we're done. Is there anything, Charlie? Anything you want to share? Uh, no, just I, I thank you for all your continued support. Of all of us, and I know this, I, I support, I continue to appreciate the staff who are doing so much uh, behind the scenes 24 7. And so I just, I keep telling them they've got to take care of themselves. <laughs> Probably better off giving advice than taking it myself. Um, but anyway, um, I so appreciate all that they're doing, those you see in the room and those who are out there um, just to making things happen. So, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure to be back here with you. Thank you. Anna, you remember the oh, you yeah. 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 Yeah.